Well, today I've been asked to talk about management of atrial fibrillation, actually first recognizing atrial fibrillation. I've been asked to talk about the role of anticoagulation, which I'm going to spend quite a bit of time on, some, some discussion of cardioversion, what we do for rate control urgently and kind of in the, in the more chronic sense. And then I do want to spend a little bit of time thinking about rhythm control options because when you see the patients, you've got to do some acute management, but you're also going to be thinking ahead to what's going to be their plan. So recognizing atrial fibrillation, as you know, you're really looking for what appears to be a narrow complex rhythm, something, something supraventricular, that has a fairly irregular rate. And you probably will recognize it. The only thing is sometimes that people have sinus rhythm with frequent premature atrial complexes. And if you see some real honest to goodness sinus P waves, then you're gonna, you're gonna think twice before giving them a label of atrial fibrillation. But I think that atrial fibrillation is not difficult to recognize. What's hard to recognize is atrial flutter, especially atrial flutter with two-to-one conduction. Um, because if you're not looking for it, those flutter waves can really hide. <clears throat> and if you look here in lead two especially, you can see these sawtooth flutter waves. See those negative sawtooth looking waves? You can see them really well in lead three here too. So if you were looking for that, and you see a narrow complex rhythm somewhere around 150 beats per minute, you're probably going to be able to make the diagnosis of atrial flutter. Um, I just wanted to go back to the previous slide and say that when you see little bumps on the baseline recording like this, we don't give that the name of flutter unless these are absolutely positively regular and reproducible. And you can put your caliper on them. If you put your caliper on these, they're not gonna march through very well. There's lumps and bumps and they just aren't all the same. Whereas if you put your calipers on these, they're perfectly regular. And so we would call that flutter. So what are the goals of therapy? Every time I meet a patient with atrial fibrillation, I have to think about three things, preventing strokes, controlling symptoms, and preventing a cardiomyopathy. That's really the whole, the whole picture right there. So how do we do that? For preventing strokes, we're going to talk about anticoagulation. For controlling symptoms, we start by trying to control the ventricular rate, and then we consider whether we're going to do long-term rate or rhythm control. And in terms of a cardiomyopathy, we have to keep the patient from having rapid rates. So you can prevent a cardiomyopathy if you're able to accomplish really good heart rate control. But the other way to do it is by restoring normal rhythm and keeping them in sinus. But as you'll hear, the problem is that some of our strategies for maintaining heart rhythm, normal sinus rhythm, involves some proarrhythmia and toxicity. We can't always have what we want. So start by talking about stroke and atrial fibrillation. And if there's one take-home point from today's talk, it's that stroke in atrial fibrillation is a very big deal. Um, atrial fibrillation, as you know, is associated with a risk of stroke and thromboembolic events. And that risk can be greatly reduced by appropriate anticoagulation. But patients and physicians tend to worry more about bleeding than they do about the stroke. And consequently, anticoagulants have been historically underused in atrial fibrillation. Now, stroke in atrial fibrillation tends to be the big stroke. It's, it's um, twice as likely to cause death and disability compared with non-embolic strokes. These are the patients who come in and they've had a big left MCA stroke and they're sitting there and they, they can't talk and 
and, you know, they can't move the right side of their body. And this is, this is really not what you want for your patients. So you should be familiar with the CHADS-VASC score, and you really kind of need to calculate this in your mind every time you see a patient. If you simply use the algorithm in EPIC, it will miss many of these things because a lot of times they're really not in EPIC. And so I do ask every one of my AFib patients the questions and try to sort out if they have a history of heart failure, hypertension, age over 65 or 75, diabetes. Do they have a history of a stroke or a TIA? That's two points right there. Um, do they have any vascular disease? And then you also add a point if they're female. And as you can see, the higher your chads vast score, the higher your stroke risk. So the guidelines for who requires long-term anticoagulation um, in this country, uh, we say that if, you, if your score is a zero or a one, you probably don't have to be anticoagulated. In Europe, they often anticoagulate for a chads vast of one, but uh, even in the United States, we recommend that if their chads vast score is a two or higher, we strongly consider anticoagulation, and that's when we have to start um, weighing the risks of bleeding. Um, we've known about this high risk for many years. Way, way long time ago, we knew that patients with valvular or rheumatic heart disease and AFib had a very high risk and needed to be anticoagulated. But it wasn't until the 1990s that there were several large trials that showed um, without a doubt that uh, warfarin was much more effective than aspirin or placebo at preventing a stroke for non-valvular atrial fibrillation. Nevertheless, um, warfarin has been underutilized historically and if you notice, these, these were patients who, who would have been eligible to have warfarin for their atrial fibrillation, and only about 55% of them were treated with warfarin. And only about 50% of patients, when polled in 2002, understood about the association between atrial fibrillation and the risk of stroke. That's why the first thing I say to somebody when I start to introduce myself as a heart rhythm doctor we start to talk about their atrial fibrillation, I tell them the first thing we have to talk about is stroke prevention because that is really, really crucial. Now, if you have physicians who have a patient with a mechanical valve, a lot of these patients will be continued on their warfarin, whereas those same physicians might use warfarin for a lot fewer of their AFib patients. So why? Why is this? And I think it's because there's a perception that it's really important to anticoagulate people with artificial valves, which it is. But the perception that it's really important to anticoagulate people with AFib is not quite as strong. And the perceived risks and benefits have been a little off kilter. Um, the perceived stroke risk is less than the actual stroke risk. The risk the perceived risk of bleeding is considerably higher than the actual risk of a major bleed. The problem is that the higher your risk for thromboembolic events in AFib, a lot of those same risk factors make you at higher and higher risk of bleeding, including age and um, a, prior, a prior stroke and hypertension. All of these things are are things we need to be worried about. I just want to throw in the statistic that patients who are treated with anticoagulation and taking non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, this, this um, increases their risk of bleeding 13-fold. So, I think that's another thing we have to keep in our mind when you're talking about the risks and benefits of adding an anticoagulant. Is your patient someone who's taking non-steroidals? And 
add that in there as, as being quite worried that they may not have a good combination of medications. So one of the studies that really affected my perception of this whole risk-benefit ratio with the anticoagulation and the risk of bleeding is a study that took patients who had a high fall risk, and it looked at their risk of intracranial hemorrhage, traumatic intracranial hemorrhage, and it also looked at um, a composite hazard ratio of treating these patients with warfarin for a composite risk of death, stroke, MI, or hemorrhage. And if you looked at uh, patients who were, who were treated with anticoagulation, um, your risk of stroke was reduced from this line here to this line down here. So that's a really big drop in your stroke risk, which is biggest, of course, at the high, um, if you see on this x-axis here, on the, the CHADS-VASC score, um, the higher your CHADS-VASC score, the higher your risk of stroke and the bigger your benefit from anticoagulation. But it's really true all the way down to, uh, to a one here, so two and higher. If you look at the increased risk of traumatic intracranial hemorrhage, which is really the bleeding we worry most about, um, you can see that there is perhaps a very tiny increase. Um, there's really not a whole lot of difference between being on anticoagulation and not being on anticoagulation for that risk. So um, this, this is the graph that I see in my mind's eye every time I sit down and talk to a patient about their, whether they should be on a blood thinner. <clears throat> and if you instead look at the HasBled scores, instead of looking at the CHADS-BASC score, you can see a very similar picture uh, where your, your risk of stroke is higher, the higher your HasBled score, and your benefit with anticoagulation is quite uh, dramatic here compared to your increased risk of hemorrhage. So just a word on which anticoagulants we use. So warfarin, as you know, is a real nuisance of a drug. It's a vitamin K antagonist. And the dosing of warfarin is incredibly variable, not only in between individuals, but in a given individual, your, your INR can go up and down all over the map depending on what drugs are added and what foods you eat, little changes in your diet. And so it's really important if we're going to use this drug that we be hitting a target of an INR between two and three. You get below two and the risk of stroke is high. You get over three, and it doesn't give you any additional benefit, but your risk of bleeding gets higher and higher. So these patients have to get a lot of blood tests, and some of them end up with a, spending a lot of their time in this target zone between two and three, and it seems almost effortless. And they, they get a, a blood test once a month, then it's always great. And then you've got some patients who are trying really hard, and they go from 1.4 to 4.5, and they're up and down and up and down, and you just can't seem to get them to stay in the target zone. I think for the patients who hit the target well, it's a great drug. I think for the patients who don't spend the vast majority of their time in that target range, you have to consider other things. So now we have other choices. And for the last few years, we've had access to several anticoagulants, which are more convenient for our patients, um, starting with the Bigatran, Pradaxa. Um, and the RELY trial um, showed that in high-risk patients, being on uh, the Bigatran was not inferior to being on warfarin in terms of preventing strokes and thromboembolic events. And then there were a series of very similar trials, and so we're not going to spend any time on the details, but 
basically showing that rivaroxaban, um, which is the RELTO, was also useful uh, and non-inferior to warfarin. And apixaban, which is Eliquis, was also a winner. And you can see, uh, and then adoxaban, which um, we haven't used a lot here, but adoxaban also, there was a, a, a trial that showed that that's also a reasonable dose, a reasonable drug for us to use. Um, and just wanted to show you that if you put some of these together and you look at the risk of stroke or systemic embolism, the bigotran, 110 milligrams twice a day, which is a dose available in Canada, uh, rivaroxaban, 20 milligrams daily, and apixaban, 5 milligrams, uh, well, these two were non-inferior to warfarin. Apixaban, 5 milligrams twice a day was actually better, as was the bigotran, 150 milligrams twice a day. These were actually better than warfarin at preventing a thromboembolic stroke. If you look at the risk of major bleeding, the risk was lower than warfarin if you were taking a Pixaban five milligrams twice a day. So that's kind of a nice drug. I think if I had to be on one of these, I think I'd like that one. Um, the Bigotran 110 milligrams twice a day also came out with less bleeding uh, than the warfarin group. Um, and if you looked at risk for hemorrhagic stroke, all of these um, non-vitamin K antagonist um, drugs, all of them outperformed warfarin in terms of uh, the risk of hemorrhagic stroke being lower. So all of them showed non-inferiority to warfarin. Um, some of them showed some superiority in terms of preventing thromboembolic events. There was um, there was less major bleeding with the Bigotran 110 uh, and a, a, a Pixaban, um, which, was, which was pretty remarkable, and there was less intracranial bleeding with all of them. So then why don't we use them for all of our patients? Well, for one thing, they're expensive, and some of our patients can afford them and some of them cannot. Um, the, uh, another reason why some of our patients won't take these drugs is that um, there are a lot of commercials on television that say, have you taken Xarelto? Have you had bleeding? Call us and we will sue on your behalf. And so the patients hear all this, and I have to explain to each one when they say, oh, yes, I've heard of that. I'm a little worried about it. I have to explain to them that all anticoagulants increase your risk of bleeding, including warfarin. But you're not going to hear about warfarin on TV because it's a cheap drug and the lawyers can't get a, a piece of any good amount of money, so they're not going to go on TV and want to sue on your behalf if you're taking warfarin. But for these other drugs, they're expensive, the companies have a lot of money, and the lawyers want uh, what they can get. So. Uh, I think it, it, it does require some explanation sometimes to undo some of the negative PR that um, they're going to hear on TV. What I really want to point out about the differences between these medications is the renal excretion. So for our patients who have perfectly normal renal function, um, any of these drugs is probably just fine. The worst and the more fluctuating their renal function gets, the more I turn towards apixaban. And in fact, there have been several recent studies out telling us that apixaban five milligrams twice a day is a reasonable anticoagulant for patients with pretty serious kidney failure. Um, we're, we're just still now, it's a moving target and getting more and more evidence that five milligrams twice a day of apixaban may be better than warfarin for some of our kidney failure patients. In any case, rivaroxaban has this dosing recommendation that if your GFR is below 50, well, it's 35 to 50, you should take 15 milligrams a day, 
And if it's greater than 50, you should take 20 milligrams a day. Well, I've got all these patients that when I look at the flow sheet of their kidney function over time, their GFR is 55, 48, 53, 46. It, it keeps crossing the line of 50. And so I always feel very uneasy treating them with Xarelto because I don't know which dose is going to be adequate or too much. Um, whereas if I'm working with something with a little, a little more forgiving for fluctuations in renal function, I'm, I'm more comfortable myself with patients like that being on a Pixaban. Also, um, we know that um, there are now FDA-approved specific reversal agents for these drugs. Um, the one that came out for dabigatran came out a few years ago, and now there's something called Andexa, which is a factor 10A, and being that, that rivaroxaban and apixaban are 10A inhibitors, um, they work, this works uh, to reverse these drugs. Now, the other two uh, oral anticoagulants that are 10A inhibitors, in theory, might be helped by this Andexa uh, reversal agent, but it has not been approved for the use with them. I guess it just hasn't been tested. There are also prothrombin complex concentrates that can be given, which are useful for the 10A inhibitors, um, but don't work very well for patients on dabigatran. Really, you don't want to give them for dabigatran. You can see it doesn't make any difference. Okay. A word about bridging. Um, so bridging anticoagulation is um, traditionally when we have a patient who's been taking warfarin and for some reason they have to come off their warfarin and we put them on heparin or Lovenox um, until their INR is therapeutic again. Well, there are some situations where bridging is good and some where bridging is probably not good. Um, the bridge trial of which we were participants, um, looked at bridging when patients were going for procedures and operations. <laughs> and it turns out that in this study, the, um, the risk of hemorrhage was higher for patients who received heparin bridging than for those who just stopped their Coumadin and then went back on it when they were done with the surgery. And there was no decrease in stroke in this study. But the caution here is that the vast majority of these patients, and this was working with a CHAD-2 score, the vast majority of these patients were not our highest risk AFib patients. So those who have a history of stroke or who have a very high chad vast score, we still do consider bridging in some situations. And I think all of us, who take care of patients with AFib have, um, have had more than one patient who've actually had a stroke when they went for their colonoscopy off of anticoagulation. So we, we do have to still keep in mind that there are some very high-risk patients who may still benefit by bridging. Bridging is also something we do if we have a patient who's just been cardioverted, and I'm going to talk a little more about cardioversion issues. Okay, so cardioverting somebody from atrial fibrillation to sinus rhythm, whether you do it with a shock or an antiarrhythmic medicine or an ablation, any of those times when you convert them from AFib to normal rhythm, um, there is a substantial risk of thromboembolism and stroke if they're not adequately anticoagulated. And that, um, that risk is uh, persistent during several weeks after cardioversion. The reason being that the atrial myocardium is often stunned. It may not start really beating right away. And so we have these fairly uh, rigorous protocols to reduce that risk of stroke. And the protocol that we've been using 
is one that was published many decades ago in CHEST, uh, which says that you have to be anticoagulated during three full weeks before and four full weeks after your cardioversion without interruption. Then in the late 90s or so, um, we had a study come out partly done at the Cleveland Clinic, the, the acute trial, which looked at whether you could use the transesophageal echo to accelerate your care. And this trial was also very rigorous and said you had to be fully anticoagulated a minimum of 12 hours prior to your TEE and cardioversion. And then you had to have uninterrupted anticoagulation during the four weeks that followed. And there was not a higher risk of stroke if you used this technique. So both of these are considered acceptable ways to move forward with elective cardioversions for people. Um, what was noted is that in people who have even one INR that drifts below two, you go down to 1.9, you go to 1.8, and um, there, there are data that show that these patients have a significantly higher risk. And so we don't like to cardiovert someone who's had a monthly INR that seems to be therapeutic. We actually like to see weekly INRs to make sure that they're not going up and down in between if we're coming up on a cardioversion. Now, all of this, all of this assumes that we have the time that the patient is stable and that we're not talking about emergencies. So this is how we like to do things when we have all of our druthers. What do we do with emergency situations? What do you do with unstable AFib? Well, if the patient is truly unstable and they're hypotensive and they're, um, they're having chest pain and they're short of breath and they're hypoxic and they really are in, in trouble and you don't see that there's any room for um, medical therapy, you may have to cardiovert somebody more urgently. If you have any, any room to slow them down, intravenous diltiazem or intravenous esmolol or intravenous metoprolol may be tried uh, to, to slow the rate. I, I would say diltiazem and esmolol because of the shorter half-life, you'll probably get away with a little bit better. Um, and a lot of times, if you can just get the rate to slow down, you can stabilize the patient. Now, one thing you have to be really careful about is you don't ever want to use an intravenous calcium channel blocker and an intravenous beta blocker in the same patient, in the same time span where they've still got active drug, um, you will get hypotension, even if your patient was stable to start with. It is perfectly okay to mix and match these kinds of drugs if you're giving oral uh, medicine or if you're giving someone intravenous diltiazem and you put them on some oral metoprolol, no problem. But if you've got a patient where you're using intravenous calcium channel blocker and intravenous beta blocker, um, and they're stable to start with, you will often get hypotension um, from that combination. So don't mix them. Um, what about digoxin? Well, digoxin isn't very effective, but it, it helps a little bit, and it doesn't cause hypotension the way these other agents can. So if the blood pressure is very low, and we see this in the intensive care unit sometimes, we've got people who are um, in persistent atrial fibrillation with rapid rates, and they really, they're in shock, not because of the AFib, but because of their sepsis or whatever is wrong with them. And so they're on pressors, and you can't give them IV beta blockers or IV diltiazem. It's just not clinically possible. You can give them uh, digoxin, and, um, and that may help a bit. Also, it can sometimes help in conjunction with those other drugs, the IV diltiazem or esmolol. If you've got somebody who's not hypotensive but who's still going fast and you're not happy with the response you're getting, adding some digoxin can help. 
So how do we do that with digoxin? Well, you can give anybody a dig load, and we give 0.25 uh, milligrams intravenously every six hours for four doses till you get to a milligram, and then you've given them a load. And that's okay even if they have renal failure and aren't making any urine because as long as you don't keep giving it to them, they're not going to then get um, toxic levels. You, just, you want to give them that amount. You've loaded them. You're done with it. And then depending on their renal function, you could give them some intermittent um, maintenance doses. Long term, maybe you don't want to digoxin for your patient with AFib, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Okay. So we're still in the intensive care unit. We've still got a patient who's got a, a rapid rate and you've given them, you've decided they're, they're, it's sort of urgent that you control the rate, but they're not unstable. You're not cardioverting them. And you've given them medicines and they're not slowing down. Um, the, the next thing to do is consider, um, consider why else they might have a, a rapid heart rate going on. So are they, are they dry? Are they wet? Do they have fever? Do they have pain? Do they have hyperthyroidism? You know, all the things that you would normally look at if you had somebody with a sinus tachycardia going on. You'd say, is this appropriate sinus tachycardia? Is this an appropriate response to something else going on with them? Are they hypoxic? They're having trouble breathing, so they're fast. They're not going to slow down until you fix whatever is making them so sick. And you gotta kinda treat that and then their heart rate will be easier to control. We see this a lot in patients who live in atrial fibrillation all the time and are on some chronic medicines at home and their heart rate's usually just fine. And they come in the hospital and they've got pneumonia and they're hypoxic and you know everything else and they are going fast. And it's because they're sick. So you got to think about the whole picture. I put amiodarone in parentheses here. Yes, amiodarone will slow the heart rate. Not quickly, though. And when you give amiodarone, you're also taking a chance that you're going to cause a cardioversion. And if you have a patient that's not been adequately anticoagulated, you may not want them in sinus rhythm. Um, right now, you just wanted to control the heart rate. So amiodarone is not something you want to go to right off the bat. All right. What about more chronically? Well, chronically, beta blockers are quite effective for heart rate control. And if your patient does not have a low ejection fraction, um, you could alternatively treat them with verapamil or diltiazem or some combination of all those drugs, beta blocker plus a calcium channel blocker. Digoxin can be an, a useful extra to, to add on to get even better heart rate control. The problem is that just about every study that comes out says that the patients who are also on digoxin have an increased mortality. Now, these are not randomized controlled trials, and it may be that for some reason the patient population that you decide needs digoxin along with all these other things has some other characteristics that's leading them to have a higher mortality. But the fact is that every study that looks at this says your patients on DIG have higher mortality than the ones who aren't. So all things being equal, if I can get heart rate control and get them off the DIG, I try to do that. Similarly, amiodarone is in parentheses here. Amiodarone is a good rhythm control medicine. It also controls heart rate. But if you're settling for atrial fibrillation, you're paying a pretty big price for rate control using a drug like amiodarone that has so much toxicity. Um, if you could get that rate control with beta blockers or calcium channel blockers, you would. Um, I have one patient in my whole practice who's on amiodarone for just rate control. And the reason she's on it is the 
very, very, very bad right ventricular heart failure that she has, and she just didn't tolerate um, a beta blocker or verapamil or dapiazem. She just didn't tolerate anything but amiodarone for rate control, and this actually worked for her. So, but it's, it's, not, it's not at the top of my list. Hello. I think it's supposed to keep going. There we go. All right. Now, I've been specifically asked not to talk about all the heart rhythm control choices we have, but I want you to at least have them up front in your mind as what's out there, why don't we use them, and so I'm only going to take a little bit of time to mention these. Antiarrhythmic drugs, we subdivide into categories. And you should be familiar with this classification of antiarrhythmic drugs. But the 1A sodium channel blockers, quinidine, procainamide, disopyramide, um, are useful for atrial fibrillation. We don't use them very much for a variety of reasons. 1B drugs don't work for atrial, atrial arrhythmias. 1B drugs are, are good for VT, but they're not good for AFib. 1C drugs, you will see patients who are on flecainide and propafenone, but you're not going to use class 1 drugs in patients who have coronary disease or heart failure, bad ejection fractions. And the reason for that is that we know from the CAF trial, which I remember when it came out, it tells you how old I am. Uh, I remember when this result came out and we had to stop the trial and call the patients from Columbia who were in, enrolled in it and say, get off your flecainide and inconide. These are great drugs at suppressing various arrhythmias, but they increase your mortality quite significantly if you're a post-MI patient with an ejection fraction of 40% or less. So after CAS, we said you can't use these drugs in patients who are like CAS patients. You increase their mortality. Class two drugs are beta blockers. Class three are potassium channel blockers, sodalaldofetilide, amiodarone, dronadarone, and these are also useful at controlling rhythm for your atrial fibrillation patients. And the class four drugs are the calcium channel blockers we discussed. Why do we, why are we strict about the use of dofetilide and sodalol? Well, because of the risk of torsade in about 3% of individuals. So you will know that we don't use these drugs in patients with renal failure. We don't use them if they have a really long um, QT interval. And we have a, a detailed uh, way of monitoring them over the first three days that they're taking the drug to make sure they're not one of those 3% who are going to die of torsade. Um, I would say that these rules should be applied to dofetilide and sodalol and to the 1A drugs if you ever happen to be putting your patient on disopyramide or, or procainamide or quinidine. Um, and that you should know that there are ways of predicting torside. You don't have to wait until you start to see it. You should notice when the QT interval is getting long, and you should notice when you start getting these uh, funny-looking um, PVCs that come right at the end of the T wave here. Uh, when you start seeing this sort of thing on your monitor, that's when you should intervene and you don't always have to wait until this happens. Amiodarone, again, I'm, I'm breezing through these drugs because this, I was asked not to talk about them. <laughs> and I, this is my, this is my, my rebellious um, part here. I really think you should at least know a little something about them. Amiodarone blocks lots of things, lots of ion channels. Um, it doesn't work fast, but you can give it to the people who can't take the, the class one antiarrhythmics, because you know, they have coronary disease or heart failure. You can give it to the patients who can't take dofetilide and sodalol because of their renal function. Um, the the proarrhythmia of amiodarone is primarily bradycardia. And then it's got all these um, non-cardiac toxicities that we pay attention to. The pulmonary toxicity is, is most uncommon, but bad, okay? Whereas thyroid toxicity is considerably more common, 
but totally treatable. And, um, and the liver toxicity is fairly rare, and you just monitor their LFTs every six months along with their thyroid function, and you're, and you're doing your job. Um, amiodarone, importantly, interacts with warfarin and digoxin, so be very careful if you're starting amiodarone to look for increases in INR and dig levels. Okay. Then there's dronadarone, which was developed in order to be amiodarone without the toxicity. And it's not as toxic as amio, but it's not as effective either. And the other difference is that it's been shown to increase mortality when you use it in patients with heart failure or chronic persistent atrial fibrillation. So it's got a pretty narrow um, application, and it's also more expensive. So you don't see a whole lot of dronadarone out there, but we, we have a few patients on that. Okay. In summary, when not to use various antiarrhythmic drugs. Don't use an antiarrhythmic drug in a patient who's not adequately anticoagulated. They might convert. You don't want them to convert. They'll have a stroke. Okay. You shouldn't give class 1 drugs to structural heart disease or coronary artery disease patients. You shouldn't give sodalol or dofetilide for renal failure patients or QT prolongation, people who otherwise have a high risk of torsad. So this boils down to that rhythm control agents, antiarrhythmic drugs, have toxicity. And so that's why we sometimes consider maybe they need an ablation, something other than, um, med other than these toxic medicines, or maybe they should just be treated with heart rate control. And why don't we just treat everyone with heart rate control? Well, the answer to that is many patients remain symptomatic even if you try very hard to heart rate control them. You also, you can't just give them a heart rate agent and assume you've got heart rate control. You actually have to see that when they're in their atrial fibrillation and they're doing something more than lying on a table for the EKG, that you actually have heart rate control. Otherwise, they may get a rate-related cardiomyopathy, and that's not good. The other thing to keep in mind is that if you're not sure which way you're going with the patient, whether you're going to go with rate control or heart rhythm control, and this is something I want you all to know because they don't come to cardiology until sometimes a year later. If you really want sinus rhythm, your best bet is to get it early. The more weeks and months the patient is in atrial fibrillation, the more sinus rhythm becomes um, uh, an improbable final rhythm for them and, and, and the less success we'll have even if we do lots of antiarrhythmic drugs and attempted ablations, the earlier you restore sinus, the more likely you are to be able to maintain sinus rhythm. So patients who don't get the cardiology until they've been in AFib for a few years, it's probably too late. So think about if you're going to want rhythm control, um, or do it early. And I thought I would just share with you this, um, this little... Um, flow sheet for antiarrhythmic drug considerations in your patients with AFib, um, which came out in 2014. For people who have no structural heart disease, they're really a candidate for everything, although you probably want to use amiodarone last. But they could take all these other drugs we talked about, or they could even go straight to a catheter ablation. Or you could try them on one of these normal drugs and then go to catheter ablation before you go to amiodarone or whatever. You have all those choices. You can do whatever you want. Structural heart disease patients, you're more limited. So if they have heart failure, um, it says you can give them amiodarone or dofetilide. I'll have to throw in here that you can usually get away with sodalol too. Um, if they have coronary disease, same drug, same drug. And then, you know, and then you either go to amiodarone or you go to catheter ablation. These are, these are your choices. But you should be aware of this on your patient's behalf. Um, you don't have to make these decisions. We're happy to see them. But to, to be able to think through 
what we might have to offer in cardiology for your patient. You need to be aware of all this. So in conclusion, antiarrhythmic drugs can increase the likelihood of maintaining normal rhythm, but this is at the expense of competing risks and toxicities, and we still have a, a, a need to use non-pharmacologic strategies sometimes for maintaining normal rhythm. So I'm going to call it a day here and leave some time for questions, particularly if you have questions about acute management issues, um, what's bugging you about a atrial fibrillation, and you know what what should we talk about? Yes. Yeah. You could, you could. Now, let me just say that people who spontaneously convert to sinus frequently have just been in AFib for a short time. And so they're not probably as critical to anticoagulate, although that 48-hour rule that came from that same chest uh, paper from many decades ago, that 48-hour rule is quite arbitrary, and the risk of having a stroke is high if their CHAD-FAST score is high and they've been in AFib for any length of time. So you could indeed help them by starting their anticoagulation uh, at that point. But um, as I say, lots of times these are patients whose CHAD-FAST is not super high and they've not been in it very long. So then you wouldn't feel compelled. Uh, yes. Yeah, that's a very interesting question. Um, and, and actually, when Lee Biblo was here, he did some, some work on that. And it turns out that your risk of thromboembolic events is high with atrial flutter. And it's not quite as high as atrial fibrillation. Um, and, and the atrium is moving. But a flutter keeps company with atrial fibrillation a lot of the time. And so these people may have atrial cardiomyopathy and scarring, which is probably what causes the strokes more than we just think simplistically that it's the, the atrium's not moving right then. Well, if they have AFib, it may just be a marker that they have a very thrombogenic surface in their atrium and they need to be um, treated with, with, with anticoagulants. So, in answer to your question, there are actually some people who have no structural heart disease, normal atria, no scar, who get their flutter ablated or whatever, and really their risk is considerably lower than a patient who has atrial fibrillation with a lot of atrial scar going on. Yes? In the young patients, they come to me with complications and have their and we didn't have this with that before. Would you consider chemical cardiovascular like in the outset before doing this? That's a, that's a good question. Um, I would have to say that I have been very impressed that patients don't always know when they go into their atrial fibrillation. Even though they sometimes know they're in it, they don't always know they're in it. And sometimes they'll be in atrial fibrillation for five days and on day five, they do some unusual exercise, and they say, wow, my heart's beating really fast. There must, there must be something wrong. I'm going to go to the hospital. Um, and a lot of those patients, granted, patients who have some sort of chad vasque elevation, a lot of those patients, when you do their TEE, there's a thrombus in there. Um, and I, I can remember times when I, was, when I was called to see a consult on a patient who was told they went into it, just 12 hours ago, can you cardiovert them? And, I, and you take the history and you say, I'm not convinced it was 12 hours ago. And then you do the TEE and you say, boy, I'm glad I didn't cardiovert them because there was a thrombus there. So it's tricky. It's tricky. Um, if you have a patient who is quite compulsive and they, you know, they've got their heart rate monitor and they they do their blood pressure every day or whatever, and they say, yes, yes, it was 70, it was 70, and today it's 160. Um, you, might, you might take their word for having been in a short time and cardiovert them without, without uh, uh, proper anticoagulation. But I'd, I'd be real careful about that. Other questions? 
Yeah. So if they have, so how I approach that, so if I've got a patient who's um, 25 years old and doesn't have any stroke risk factors and they have periodic palpitation, I mean, I'm only going to try to monitor it if I want to make a diagnosis for treating their symptoms. But if I've got a patient in my office who is older and has pretty good stroke risk factors, their CHAS VAS score is up there, and they give a history of some episodic um, arrhythmias, and I'm thinking it could be AFib, um, making that diagnosis would change therapy. I would, I would put them on anticoagulation if I saw that they were having AFib. So then I would want to know how frequent are their symptoms. And, you know, if they're having this more than once a month, you can probably pick it up on a 30-day monitor. But many of our patients with real and significant paroxysmal AFib episodes have their, have their um, symptoms less than every month. And for our patients who have had cryptogenic stroke um, and you don't pick up any AFib on a 30-day monitor, those are patients where you might consider the implantable loop recorder, this little teeny loop recorder that goes under the skin and has a three-year battery. So, I mean, that's something you might, you might do for them. Yeah. There's a patient from the general medical store for which they're called who go from AFib to AFib with RDR spontaneously. While they are not symptomatic at all, they have no, like you said, they don't realize they're going to AFib. Mm -hmm. What is the threshold to do uh, rate control on them if they if they have a pattern of going back into their normal rate? When do we when do we wait and when do we do rate control immediately for these patients? When do we wait and when do we do what? When do we do rate control for them uh, immediately as opposed to waiting and seeing okay. if they're going back into their Um. Well, I think that if somebody is going in and out of atrial fibrillation with RVR they probably deserve to be on a rate control agent in the long term. So I would think you don't have to wait. You could say, yeah, they should be on something for rate control. They, they already are on rate control. Uh -huh. what, what do we do as emergent management as opposed to waiting oh. and waiting oh. that they go back oh. to what well, If they're stable, I mean, if they're stable clinically and no symptoms, you don't have to do anything in a big hurry. Um, but you do want to think about the fact that even if they're asymptomatic, if they're spending a lot of time going too fast, they might be wearing out their heart and getting that tachycardia-induced cardiomyopathy. So you, you might take advantage of the fact that you're, you have them on a heart monitor to push up the dose of their rate control drug because you want to you wanna push it to the point that they're not spending too much time going too fast. But at the same time, you always worry about how slow they're going to go when they're back in sinus. So you have them on a monitor. That's a great that's a great time to figure that out. It's not an emergency, but it's convenient. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, that's a tough one. Um, that's a tough one. So if, if you have a situation that you absolutely know is, is transient, so the best example being your young, healthy person who comes in with thyroid storm and they have AFib and you treat them and when you treat their thyroid and they get to be you thyroid again, um, you expect they're not going to have any more trouble with AFib and you don't think they need long-term anticoagulation. That, that certainly, I think all people would agree that if you have a reversible trigger like that, you're not going to need, or they have their only ever episode of AFib after their heart surgery, okay? And three days after the heart surgery, they have AFib and you figure that's not something they're just going to have regularly, at least you hope not. But you're talking about someone who comes in because they're septic or they have pneumonia. Uh, 
and they end up, they're very, very sick in the hospital, and you detect their atrial fibrillation. And the question you ask yourself is, are we seeing this atrial fibrillation because they're so sick, or are we seeing this atrial fibrillation because they go in and out of their silent AFib and they happen to be on our monitor because they're, they're in the hospital with this other thing? And it can be hard to tell. And for them, I would put more weight on what are their stroke risk factors, you know. And if there's somebody with a pretty low stroke risk and you really think that this was because they were septic and you had them on pressors and that's why they did AFib, then I wouldn't necessarily commit them to lifelong anticoagulation. You know, but if they have a, a TASVAS score of eight and they do this, then I would say, yeah, 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 they probably deserve long-term anticoagulation. I mean, there's been some discussion, do people with TASVAS score of eight deserve anticoagulation with or without atrial fibrillation? So, so I would say if you've seen it and it's, and it's a really high TASVAS score, I, I, might, I might treat them, yeah. Any other questions? I always wanted to ask about atrial fibrillation or other bad rhythms. Okay. Okay, great. Well, you'll see lots of AFib. So if you're good at AFib, you'll be an expert most of the time. Okay.